Um, so I just want to first of all ask you about um, did you you're you're from Mayo? Are you originally? Yeah, born and born and bred in Mayo. It's in uh, Swinford. Swinford, okay, lovely. And what what was your experience of growing up there like? What was it like? In the what, what, what year were you born in? I was born in 1984, and um, growing up, I remember Ireland being very simple when I was growing up, as in like everyone was kind of packed in together. Everyone went to mass on Sunday. <clears throat> if we were going somewhere in the car, we'd all be in the car together, or like maybe could be 10 of us in the car together going to see the cousins. And yeah. uh, Ireland was very poor, so nobody really had anything. And we used to all, I think myself and my sisters and brothers, we all shared a bed as well. So it was fairly tight. And then, yeah. so the first, yeah, the first eight years of my life, it was actually great crack because I was hanging out with my cousins and family all the time, yeah. watching cartoons and, and mostly outside playing in the fields. Yeah. And did you play much, did you play much sports or... Anything like that. I played football. I played football all the time. I always had a football with me, and uh, I was always trying to do as many solos as I could in the shed. <clears throat> and I remember one day I got up to like 128 solos without the ball dropping, and I was like, "Yes!" <laughs> and I had a cousin. I had a cousin. He was competitive as well, and he goes, "Oh, sure, I did 200." And I was like, pissed off. I was like, "How did he manage that?" But then he showed me his technique, and he was letting the ball bounce on the ground in between every solo. <laughs> so I was like, "You're definitely cheating there." But uh, yeah, no, I was I was playing football all the time. Always yeah. trying to, always thinking. My first dream was to become a professional footballer for Man United. Ah, okay, yeah, because that that you hit the glory, you hit the glory stage of Man United, didn't you? The kind of like yeah, I kind of hopped on the bandwagon just around the time when they're starting to get good, and yeah, Fergie yeah. was doing some good stuff. So then I just, I think the first time I watched them playing was they lost in the final to Aston Villa two one. But I okay. remember thinking. I remember thinking I liked the players. For some reason, I liked the players. I don't know what it was. Mark Hughes and Brian McClare and Paul Ince and them, them lads. So I just kind of stuck with them from then on. And then I kind of got obsessed by them. And I yeah. had posters all over my bedroom walls of Steve Bruce. He was the first right. man I saw every morning. Yeah, that's good. That's a good one to wake up to. That'll give you motivation anyways. Yeah, that's definitely. Just to see a sweaty English man with dirt <laughs> on his shin pads who I've never met before in my life. <laughs> There was also a good few Irish players out at that time, where like Roy Keane, you have Paul Ince as well, didn't you? Or no, not Paul. Yeah, uh, what was Dennis Irwin. Dennis Irwin. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> so there's a lot of kind of like connections with Man United. I'm a I'm a yeah. Liverpool supporter, but I don't have I don't have any grudge against Man United. It's fine. I'm I'm I can handle the the rivalry well. Um, but, well, the thing is, it's like it's like Everton, but like over the years, it became so commercialized that like you, I'm yeah. not into it as much as I used to be, but like. Yeah. Yeah, back in them days, it seemed to be a bit more kind of crack. Whereas nowadays, it's more like it's more like all about the money, really. So yeah, it is. It Liverpool, is. Liverpool yeah. are a great team, though. I yeah, they were, there was a there was a kind of um, like I'm a, I'm a lot younger than you, so I'm only twenty four, almost twenty five. But I I grew up in I was born in ninety eight, so I I Oof. I hit the like I hit my peak was at the age of about six. I was praying on the stairs when the Liverpool were 3-0 down against AC Milan and then they came back. Oh, no way. Yeah. Crespo. And, and uh, yeah, yeah. And then I was, but it was like, it was like, you know, people talk about the first hit of a drug, they, they keep chasing the dragon. Like I, I had <laughs> a solid 10 years of chasing the dragon with Liverpool after that point. Um, yeah. And the clock came and it was fantastic. But um, yeah, it was, but do you think, do you think that there was more of a connection between like, even in Mayo, do you think things have got a little bit further away? So if you're, you know, if, if maybe not with GAA, but like with football where, you know, the, the connection from the top to the kind of roots of things to where... Oh, it, definitely. Yeah, yeah, it was it was much, much closer together, like, uh, yeah. because nowadays it's like they're multi-millionaires. Like everyone at the World Cup was probably like a multi-millionaire that was playing. Like, so it's kind of harder to connect with them, you know, whether it's back in them days the likes of Mark Hughes and all them lads, you know, and they kind of seemed like fellas you might even meet when you go into the shops. Yeah. And yeah. you felt like you could maybe get to their level. But nowadays it's just, it's like the distance between the two has just changed so much. So like it's got so serious and so much training is involved and like it's down to the fitness. And, you know, even in them days in, in the, I suppose the nineties, the boys, they'd be drinking a bit more as well. Not that, not that, you know, that's a good thing when you're doing sports. Oh, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. It was more kind of like, I don't know. It, it was, 
I suppose it's it's got so serious and professional now. That's it's a good yeah. and bad thing. It's good in the sense that there's such good players out there now, but it's bad in the sense that it's almost too polished and it's it's like too slick nearly. Yeah, you don't you don't you, know? you don't get the kind of human side of them. Like I, I find that I find yeah, it, exactly like I'm even as a Liverpool supporter, I absolutely love Gary Neville. I think he's a great pundit. I think he's fantastic. Um and I've looked in, I've watched the stuff on Man United as well about like the night, you know, the, the class of 93. And, and, and you just feel like you're actually connecting with someone who you could have, um, you know, you, like you have something similar with, you know what I mean? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the likes of the Gary Neville thing as well, like, yeah, he's, he was, he was a fine right back. So he was, but the only thing is yeah. he's got every podcast under the sun now. And it's, there's only so much analysis you can do with football. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and he's constantly on about it. And it's like, that's another side of things too. It's over. It's nearly overanalyzed. Yeah. To the point yeah. where, like, it's kind of like the fun has gone out of it, and the yeah, whole yeah. situation with VAR as well. Like, that's. During, what did you make of VAR during the World Cup? Um, it was, it was, I thought it was all right. It was good at points, yeah. but other times in it was a bit like. Oh, there was man. a moment in the very first game where I think it was Ecuador had the most. I think it was some stupid goal this loud, yeah. and I think all of us were watching. Some of my friends were watching the pub, and we were all just like. Oh, Qatar have rigged this. They've they've <laughs> yeah, they <have> rigged. <laughs> but, uh, no, I think it was okay. I think people. I don't. I'm not like that. I think VAR is. I think it's it's better to have it than not have it. I think it's just um, they could do it more like rugby, where they have the ref. I think they are going to do that, where they have the ref. Like you know, you can hear yeah, yeah. It's going through. Um, but I I still just sort of love. I think. I love football as a sport so much that I kind of ignore all the other stuff. But yeah. I do I, I do agree. It's kind of a shame. Like that's one of the things that I think is great about um GAA. Like what well, I'm I'm from Dublin, but my dad is from Cabin. So I go to Cabin quite a lot. And you're a hybrid. Yeah, I'm a hybrid. Like, yeah. <laughs> you got the best of both worlds. Best of both worlds, yeah. And when Ka- Cabin did really well, they got to the semi-final of the All Ireland. I think it was during COVID in 2020. And the whole county went nuts. Like it was just <laughs> signs everywhere, um, people going on it. Like it was just crazy. And I, I that there's something really important about that. I, I'm sure in Mayo it's the same, even though yeah. you still have the curse. But we still have the curse. But at the same time, some fella said to me years ago, he's like, sure, if we win it, what do we do then, anyway? So yeah, I suppose it, I kind of tricked myself into thinking I don't mind if we don't win it just yet, because at least when we kind of keep getting to the final, if we keep getting there. It's kind of exciting. At least we're getting to the final, anyways. And it's like it's yeah. only one more step, really. But uh, with the guy, yeah, the guy feels definitely more like maybe how soccer felt, maybe in uh, the early nineties, and that it's more. Yeah, you you can kind of relate to it more, and it's kind of like working class and people. It's like it seems to be more heart involved as well, and it's not about your image. It's more about like giving as much as you can. I don't know for your local teams or whatever, but um. The Mayo curse thing is a tricky one, yeah, because there's been so many times where, you know, Mayo are like, they're in the final and you're like, this is the year now. And you're telling everyone. Yeah. And like, even times where you're like, I won't say anything to anyone, but inside you're thinking, we're definitely going to take it this year. And then it yeah. just, we just come up short. So. Was the last like, time against Tyrone, was it that, was, was that a, two years? I think years? it was Tyrone, yeah. I, yeah. Th- I think it was Tyrone, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was kind of certain, even going into the game, I actually went to that game. And I was like, oh, yeah, we have it now. Tyrone, they're tough lads, but yeah, we're going to beat them. Because we just bet Dublin as well. So I was like, of course we're going to win it this year. And then we lost. And coming yeah. out of the stadium, I was like, oh, God, this is going to be a long journey back to Mayo. Sometimes <laughs> it's hard when you, beat, when you beat a team like that in the semi-final to kind of regroup. and Because yeah, you, 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 know, you put so much energy into it that it's like... That's it. You, it's just hard to get, to get pumped and motivated again to play. Definitely. You know, Sometimes I just try to look into it from the perspective of the, you know, like we say Dublin, they're kind of more ruthless. Yeah. Maybe I'm trying to see why, why are Mayo teams not as ruthless, we'd say, as Dublin or why, or even Tyrone or even Kerry. Yeah. Those three teams, like, for example, they're, they're really ruthless. Like, if they're winning by a few points towards the end of a game, the ch- in a final, the chance there, they're not going to give it up. So, yeah. Something, there's something about maybe the Mayo psyche that needs to be a bit, they need to be a bit nasty, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, or a bit more cute, maybe a bit more cute, because there was a couple of games there where I think we were playing the dubs, <clears throat> and one of the lads from Dublin got sent off. I don't know what it was for, but it, the, we were kind of winning. Yeah. But um, straight away, then a Mayo lad got sent off because I think he 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 must have been riled up or whatever. But 
he should have been more cute and just kind of held yeah. back yeah, yeah, yeah. and calmed down and maybe wound up a few players. So maybe get a couple of lads sent off could be the way to go. Yeah. I know it sounds bad, but is that is the guy from that team still alive? Is he still is he still going around? There's rumors that one of them is still alive. Uh, I think he's knocking around New York. I think he had to <laughs> he had to mic he had to migrate because lads were like, How's the heart, Mickey? <laughs> so they were following him around. But uh one of them did pass away there a few years ago, and someone said that that was the last one. But I, I think there might be one lad left in New oh, York. God. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but you know about the curse and the priest and all that stuff. I, I know. I don't know. But I'm not sure. I haven't heard about the priest, but I only know about. I just know about the last team. This uh, no, was it. Wasn't the witch? Was it a witch or something? I, I've heard lots of. They were stuff. going through. I, I think it was the year they won it in 1951, and they were they were driving. You know the way when you win it, you must drive through every town in your yeah. in your county just to parade it. But they were going through Foxford and uh, there was a priest doing a funeral. And like, because the lads on the bus were cheering, they're like, way, and everyone at the funeral obviously was crying because someone was dead. The priest was like, not on my watch. And he apparently prayed to God, or not prayed to God, but chatted to God and said, put a curse on that team until, and, until everybody's dead and never win it again. So uh, There must be Chinese that. whispers or something because I heard a story about there was a witch, some sort of like witch woman who who had <laughs> against the Mayo team. So then she put a curse on them to never win it again until all the members were dead. But either way, it's yeah. kind of, it's weird how it's actually, you know, it's been true, which is kind of scary. Um, yeah, that is but, it, you know. And then, like, you know, around the time, we, you know, the time Leicester won the Premier League. Yeah. I think in a few different circles outside of Ireland, the Mayo team were kind of getting recognition. I think it was actually mentioned in some American football station. They were okay. like, on this Mayo team, they haven't won it since 1951, but look what Le- Leicester City did in the, in the UK leagues. <laughs> so I was like, Jesus, it's getting more right recognition. But then we got to the final and we lost it again. And I was like, ah, fuck America. <clears throat> do, you think, do, you think that peop- uh, do you think that people in the countryside of Ireland have more... So have more of a connection to that kind of like um, I feel in Dublin superstition and and not not even just superstition but just like that kind of like um, I don't know what to call it the kind of like um, old traditions. Yeah. Do you think that do you think it's still a bit more alive in the countryside or do you think it's dying as well there? Well, too? I know it's well it's it's definitely I mean across the world it's kind of slight, slowly dying unfortunately because as like technology comes in things are kind of changing and getting more advanced like but yeah I'd say in the countryside the countryside of Ireland is definitely more in its traditions than the city centre would say of Dublin but yeah. if you go out to the countryside of Dublin I'm sure like you're meeting lads who are making putchin and stuff like that but yeah now you might you might get many lads down the bog there but uh yeah. yeah I think I think traditions I think they're still like everything really when towns and stuff like that get built up you, you unfortunately you you start to lose the traditions but if you go out to somewhere like Belmullet or uh even Ackill even though Ackle's yeah. kind of, I know Ackle is great too, but you know, with tourism and everything, yeah. these cafes and all that stuff kind of pop up. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's a tricky one because then you go into the cafe because you want to get your coffee. So, you know, yeah. I suppose, what do you do really? Like it's kind of, it's nearly, it's almost inevitable, but there's definitely p- plenty of parts of Ireland where the traditions are still strong. Um, do, you, do you think that, uh, I mean, I'm, I've been to lots of parts of me. I've been to, obviously been to Ackle and I was in Belmullet a while ago and then, do you think the kind of ruralness like in May of this, like you some parts of it, you're really like, wow, this is I'm really in time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in, the, I'm in the wilderness here. This is kind of amazing. Um, and yeah. do you think it kind of helps in to keep that kind of uh, like mindset? Or, or even just a connection to nature. I think people in Dublin kind of lack that connection to the landscape and understanding where stuff comes from, you know, which I think. Yeah, any city, any city, really, I think when yeah. people are in the city, because, you know, I was living in the city for five, six years and you, you get everything down the shops. So you kind of you kind of forget about it. But then there's a bit of a payoff of that, too, because your mental health might suffer because, you know, everybody should maybe be in everybody should spend a bit more time in nature. Like so, yeah, yeah. I suppose. But that's not to say that everyone down here isn't shopping in Tesco either, because most people no, are no, in yeah. Tesco anyways, like, yeah. you know, so it's not like we're killing chickens here. But uh, no, I just I mean, think, that there's a slow, there's a. A kind of um, rec- like just recognition or a level of a slower kind of pace to things where it's not as 
front it's not as much on the line or not as much kind of no no definitely not no no we're definitely not i mean any anywhere in the countryside yeah you're definitely not as it's not as quick paced yeah and sometimes you do you do feel like you're missing out but like yeah. i suppose the good thing is you kind of in you know so i know when i'm in the city anyways i always get a bit antsy and i'm always like geez my clothes i need to get new shoes because they're not good enough that lad's got better shoes than me or yeah. Look at the state of my beard or whatever like that, you know. So yeah. it's kind of like it, I feel more insecure anyways when I'm in the city. But I'm sure people who are born in the city don't feel like that. So I, I'm like, I have a friend from Blanchetown and he comes down to, to visit me here in, in Mayo. And he's he loves Mayo like, but you can kind of tell after a few days, he's like, uh, I, I want to get back to the city because there's stuff going on. Yeah. Here it's kind of like nothing's going on really. Like, you know, the, the only people that will pass the house could be if a neighbor the odd time and then maybe a, a few cows you might be moving around so yeah. it's like it's it's all good and well it's nice you know but then obviously the winter months then are tough as well yeah of course but do you think that there like um there's a lot a lot of kind of i think maybe with the rise of you know like social media and so people get more isolated and lonely but do you think that the community aspect of the countryside is strong is it is it strong or is it is it just, it's definitely been... strong. It's it's definitely yeah. strong, but like with I think social media was definitely like uh it was kind of like a tough thing for everybody. And I think that's yeah. definitely put a divide between people, no matter where you are in the world, you know. And then after the lockdown and everything, people are a bit more they're kind of a bit more cautious. But yeah. um I was I was living in Bell Mullet for, for the lockdown. <clears> yeah. And it was like definitely a, a very strong community spirit there. Yeah. Everybody was kind of like checking in on each other and like um, the pub obviously wasn't open because of lockdown, but when it reopened again, everyone was in there having the chats and everything like that. So that's fantastic. I think, yeah, yeah, it's really nice. You know, yeah. it's, it's it's very very important too to for the community spirit and not to forget about people. And it's easy to be on the phone all the time. And sometimes you know I get caught up on it myself. But yeah, it's 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 important to get out there and maybe. But the thing is, you know, like I remember when even in the nineties, instead of my younger brother, we'd just go out to the fields for like hours and hours and we'd go exploring across the fields and I'd be taking him places because, yeah. you know, he was very small, like he was maybe six or seven. So really, I shouldn't have even been taking him out of the house, but I wanted company. So yeah. we'd be calling up to the neighbor's house and the neighbor could be like, he could have been in his late 70s and he'd be sitting mm. there smoking a pipe and he'd be giving us like bottles of red lemonade and yeah. um, we'd be there for hours. Like, But that doesn't happen anymore now because it, there's it's almost like there's a bit of a block when it comes to just knocking into a neighbor's house because you I might feel like you yeah. might be getting in their way a bit or, or maybe you might feel like you might give them a cold or something you know it's, it's a bit silly really but yeah well that i mean i get it with i get it with covid but like i think more even before that i think it's more of a kind of like um i'm very conscious about sort of my i still ha i still use like my stuff on my phone but i'd be very conscious about not yeah uh, you know engage i think it's very important to engage <laughs> with the world um and even i notice that you're kind of like i don't even know if it's anxiety i think it's just literally the what the the mechanism within it makes you it makes you constantly think about what's next you know what's con it's constantly like you're not yeah. you're not focusing on what's important in the moment and therefore you know some old, so for a kid now some old man on a chair sitting outside of his house is nowhere near as important to him you know no but it's I not it's boring yeah, but actually that's sometimes they're the most important things in life, just being able to have a routine conversation with someone that you live next to. It's not amazing. Definitely, Finn, hundred percent, you know, and like even for myself, I was doing their to-do list last year and I was, you know, you'd put like 20 things on the to-do list and you'd be going through it throughout the day and you'd be like, right, I did four or five of those things and you wouldn't feel content because <clears throat> you never get it finished. And then this year I'm like, I'm just going to do a few things every day related to work. Yeah. And then a few things related to fitness and then just leave it at that, you know, and don't be like trying to feel like I have to be constantly kind of having something achieved in order yeah. to progress my career or anything like that. You know, it's, yeah, we're putting, we're putting ourselves under too much pressure. And I think it's, that's where a lot of the mental stress is coming from. Like yeah, back I, in the day, yeah. people, people would just knock into the house and they'd have a cup of tea and it'd be like, do you want to go for a walk? And it wasn't like, no, I have to do this, this, and this. And it's like, oh yeah, I'll go for a walk with you for a few hours. I think that's you learn a lot from the land yeah. as well. You know, you learn a lot from being out in nature. Sorry, I cut across you there. No, no, you know, you're fine. It happens. Uh, it's just, yeah, I think I completely agree. And even what you're talking about with the footballers earlier, I think is very true to what has happened with, um, you know, we, we're so kind of focused. We've as a, a society we've become so focused on the sort of superficial elements of our personality 
And yeah. it's a real shame because I think, I think like for me, I spent a lot of time when I was a kid in West Cork. I even I spent time in, in Galway, uh, uh, like on uh, West Cork was that? Yeah, uh, I used to, I used to go to Shirkin Island, so that was uh, near Baltimore, like Skipperine, that kind of area. Oh, nice, and then, lovely. And then I would spend time in Inishbofin, so off the coast of Galway. And then, I know well, yeah. Yeah, and I think just, yeah, that kind of like, not really doing anything, but just sort of being with what was happening was so just kind of amazing. And I think it's, I don't think we're going to go in the right direction if we lose that kind of thing. And I, I'm, I think yeah. Ireland is it's so amazing. Like I, like I, I get concerned when people kind of, you know, there's a big, there's a lot of talk. And even in Hardy books, you have a way that where, you know, Eddie's talking about going off to America and that's fine. Like I, I'm not against that, but a lot of people talk about leaving Ireland and they want to go away and they want to, and that's fine. Like obviously people can go, but at the same time, we don't appreciate it enough when we're in Ireland. No, you know, people don't go around saying, actually, yeah. that's pretty incredible. Like we do have you reckon that that's, is that something to do with social media, do you think, or, or what is that? Um, well, I was here before social media, so I don't know about, but I think maybe it's just, uh, well, definitely now it could be. I think maybe people are, as you were saying, so focused on- heightened anyways by social media, definitely. Definitely. I think career, like careers and <clears throat> what you need to be happy has gone up so much, you know? I think yeah, the pressure for people to be like multimillionaires by the age they're sort of like 22 is like, has never been yeah. more extreme. Um, yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Like it's you're, look, you're looking at people on the phone. You're looking at people on the phone. And you're like, this lad was a multimillionaire by the time he was 23, and all <laughs> you got to do is do these five things every morning, and you start doing it for like three or four mornings, and you then something else happens, and you're like, fuck, I've lost me me way. Yeah, it's just, yeah. yeah being being in the moment is the hardest thing, but if you can do that, I think you're it's half the battle. But also, there's the rent problem as well in Ireland. You know, that's that's a that's big good. thing for people. So that's that's kind of me- fucking with people. I think that's that's a completely bad. I, I, don't, I don't think that that's just a problem in, in itself that has to be resolved. Um, yeah, because yeah, you're living does, in the city center. Yeah, I live I live near enough. Yeah, near enough. It. Um, um, but it's yeah, it's it's a, it's definitely a problem. I I just mean more outside of that. I mean more of kind of like um, the landscape in Ireland is just fucking. Oh, yeah. it's unbelievable. You know what I mean? It yeah. really is. Um, and I just hope that we we can. It's really important, I think, to promote contentness, you know, over over a lot of other things. I obviously, yeah. was obviously being well off and is important, and, and having money is important. But being content with what you have is a very important thing. And I and I, a lot of what ha- what used to be, and I'm sure, you know, like what what used to the situations that used to be in in, in Ireland, obviously with the church and everything have. It's great that we've progressed on, but I think we're losing certain elements of Irish society that I I would like to retain. I don't know if you feel the same way or of of yeah, definitely. I suppose the oh yeah, definitely like lots of like conversation storytellers. That's definitely something that I'd like to kind of like see more of. Um, but also like even if the thing about it is we have like so much choice now in a way. That's kind of a big problem too. You know, with the likes yeah. of Netflix. Yeah. all the shows on there so it's almost like you kind of get so exhausted by looking at them you're like oh there's so many things i need to watch and you yeah. save all these things on your computer and your phone but back in the day if you wanted to watch a movie you'd wait till the weekend and you went to town to rent it so it was more like you'd get the movie and you'd have it there and you'd be like oh i'm so excited to watch this and you'd get a better sen- sense of uh, satisfaction at the end of the movie because you know you would have t- scratched that itch whether well, nowadays i have like so much crap like so many tabs open on my laptop that I'm like, I've half watched stuff for us. I'm watching a movie and I'm checking something I didn't understand. So I'm kind of like not really engrossed in the movie. So I suppose there's so much, there's so many things trying to grab at your attention now that that's causing a lot of problems too, you know, and social media. I mean, I make my career off social media, so it's kind of hypocritical of me to give out about it. But at the same I don't time, think, I don't think that's a problem. I think it's more, I, I have the opinion of like, I post stuff. I'm not, I'm not not on social media. I just think that it's the, I don't have any problem with the sharing of stuff. 
it's more the mechanism that underlies it which makes you like it's addictive it's literally yeah it is yeah yeah like literally recognized to be they made it like gambling that's what what i think is wrong with it it's not it's not the sharing of content is great you know what i mean like it's great that you can just automatically upload stuff online and the whole world if you want to can see it um, yeah. it's, it's not definitely it's just caused the, a lot of anxiety with people including like just the idea of even if you're touching your phone in your pocket and you're like you're constantly thinking how much battery do I have left or and then you always have a reason to be on the phone so that's that's something that I never experienced until maybe maybe around 2005 that's when I was like geez this phone is kind of it's kind of taking over a bit here yeah I think it's also what you're saying about films like I noticed when I I just don't have any of the apps on my phone that's how I get around it so I just I kind of insanely just download everything when I need to upload something and then I just delete it all again um that's a good idea I like that so you, so for example, Instagram, you don't have that in your phone, but I have it on my phone because I, I've just, you know, I've done, I've done the twelve steps program. Like I accept <laughs> that I'm an addict. You know what I mean? And um, the first step is accepting it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, I accept that I'm a, a social <laughs> addict. So it's just too dangerous for me if I have it on my phone because I will just constantly check it. And yeah, um, it, it, I even noticed like I experimented for a while having it on my phone. Just for a day, because I'd taken a long break from having it on my phone, and I had it for a day. And I tried to watch him. I tried to watch football yesterday, and I was, was watching a bit of, of a movie, and I couldn't concentrate. I could not concentrate. I couldn't m- maintain five to ten minutes of like concentration on the thing that I was watching. Yeah. So I knew then I had to just, uh, and then instantly within like an hour I, I, off my phone, I was just way more focused on on what I was. Yeah. Doing. That's it. It. And you know, you always, you always see somebody who's a bit taller than you or better looking than you or got a bit yeah. more money than you or a bit more success. And that's, that's what the whole social media apps are kind of built on. They're built almost on jealousy. So that, yeah. you know, for example, that's and fair play to you. That's, you've given me a good idea. I might, I might actually delete some of my apps actually in the phone. But yeah, um, yeah, it's not, you, don't have to, you don't have to delete the account. You just have to, I think it's just this sort of, you have to get around... I can't control. Some people say they can leave it on their phone. They can control that, but I can't. So I just know that like not on my phone, I won't look at it. Yeah. But the way society is kind of going, it it's almost makes you feel like, well, if you're not involved, if you're not following this page online or whatever, you're kind of missing out. So like, it's up to you. So it's constantly trying to pull you back in. Yeah. And it's about, it's a, it's, you have to kind of walk a, you, you can't, you can't, I don't think there's any way you can't like not engage with it. You know what I mean? You can't, it's a part, of, as you say, it's very important for you. It's for your job. It's important for, you know, it's an important part of society now. So you can't not you can't kind of like abandon it. But um, do you think, do, I want to ask you about, about in Mayo, was there any, like, I love the thing I By love. Way, Finn, I hope this hasn't got too serious. This, if you no, want to I, love, I love it. This is great. I want to, I want to, I want to, you know, we can, I, I'm, this is great conversation. Um, and I, um, in, in Mayo, was there any, like, um, I love the kind of old fairy stories in Ireland, like the old kind of like the, the sort of mythical stories of all old you know, creatures and things in Ireland. And was there any of that growing up in Mayo where there was someone who would sort of tell you a, a crazy story about some sort of you know, otherworldly animal or anything like that? Otherworldly animal? Not really. Like, you know, I mean... Any fairy tale? I mean, there, there was, there's, there is plenty of them, but I, I'm trying to think off the top of my head if there are any, if there are any actually particular stories. Um, well, as the, I suppose there's the Queen of Connacht story where she went up to, up the north, uh, up to Ulster to get to show off her. No, sorry, it was to collect a bull. I think it was. Okay. You know the story? No, no. I forget the name of it, but I think it's something along the lines of I'm going to probably butch this all together now. But Queen Queen Maeve and her husband. We're just after making love in the bed and like the husband was like i've got more cows and bulls than you and she's like no you don't and he's like i do go out there and check so he, she went out to check and lo and behold she was a bull short so she was like oh yeah you do fair enough so I, what i'll do is i know a fellow up i think it was ku cullen or someone up ulster he had a very special bull and uh she was like i'm going to send some some of my soldiers up to get the bull so she sent them up and they were like, well, Cullen's not here at the moment. He's gone out for a walk or whatever. And the soldiers were like, well, she's going to take the bull off you anyways. So then it ends up in an epic kind of five-day fight up, up in Ulster. And um, 
I think, I don't know. I think she ends up getting the bull anyways. And herself, I don't know what her, happens herself and her husband, but it's an epic three day, three or four day fight. But anyways, I remember reading it at the time in school, but there was a lot of talk about crows as well in it. And there's loads of crows in Mayo, but I, so that's why, like, I always like talking about them, but they were apparently like in battles throughout the years, they'd always be like knocking around fights because they'd always be like taking the, the remains of what was left over. So you'd see a lot of crows. Um, you'd hear about a lot of crows in Irish stories, but there's no real kind of like local stories that stand out. Uh, was there was any fairy forts or anything around the area? Because I there was fairy forts. Yeah, there's yeah. a fairy fort in, in the field next to me, and uh, I remember my father saying, "Never, never go near that, like because there might be something that'll happen to you in your life." There's a lot of superstition going on as well, you know. So Fair, I, I remember like it's fascinating. Yeah, if we if we were cutting the field, like we'd cut around the fairy fort, and it was weird because it was just like this lump in the middle of the field. So it was uh, they never actually cut into it, but now actually it's gone. So people don't really care as much. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then Haw I think Haw hawthorn trees. They used to say that witches lived inside hawthorn trees. Yeah. And like that, if you got if you got your finger caught in one, that means there was a witch trying to tell you something. Do you think what? Where do you do you think that came from? Was that kind of like a pagan hangover or was that like, where do you think that that kind of stuff came from? I'd say it was, well, I'd say probably a pagan hangover, but also yeah. entertainment values as well. And you're like, you know, if people are coming to your house or you're going to someone's house or you're dry walking from one village to the next with the lad and maybe you're having a couple of shots of putching or maybe yeah. you're sitting on a ditch smoking a pipe for an hour, you know, especially in nighttime where there was less, number one, there was less lights. So you wouldn't see what was going on over there. So those a lot more imagination yeah. and I think people kind of like built up these stories over time and that's why it was passed passed between yeah. people and obviously then with Chinese whispers the, the stories would grow legs but like it was a I suppose a respected a respected tradition back in them days to be the storyteller yeah. because you call into someone's house and they'd give you a tea or they'd give you putchy and sure like you could make your living off telling stories yeah yeah they don't call it spirits for nothing <laughs> exactly yeah yeah I wish I knew a story though. You're gonna, I'm gonna have to look into that. Uh, maybe next time we do this, I'll have to, I'll have a story in the bank for you because I feel like I butchered that Queen Maeve story there. Oh no, it's interesting to hear because I'm delete I'm, that. No, no, that's fine. I'm, I'm really fascinated <laughs> by, um, that like, that old Irish, like the same thing with the kind of cure. Did you have that in Mayo as well, where like someone would give, you'd have some sort of ailment or something, and then someone would give you something that you'd hold on to or you keep with you as a cure for something? Um, yeah, I suppose actually, yeah, now that I think about it, my mother used to, well, my mother used to have this thing about rabbit's tails. Yeah, okay, okay. Where if, I think of something to do with warts, if you got a wart, yeah. what you would do is you'd have a rabbit's tail and you'd wrap it in tissue and you'd keep it under your pillow and lo and behold, the next day, the wart would be gone. And she was like, now I don't know if that's true or not, but I seen it happen a few times and the warts were always gone. Yeah, yeah. So. You'd wonder if they're just messing with you or else was it, is there something placebo happening in the mind? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it could be. It's, placebo is definitely a real thing. So it's very, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's interesting anyway. And uh, do you think that when, I mean, I don't know if you were, when you were like writing Hardy books originally, did you, do you think that you were, were you trying to capture a sort of like the slower kind of simple sort of everyday life of, being in the countryside or what was the kind of, we just doing a, we just trying to make yourself laugh. Like what was the process? I think because it was, we tried to, I don't think we actively tried to represent what was happening in Irish yeah. society at the time. It was just because we were kind of like 50% the actual characters at the time. Some of us were anyways. <laughs> I definitely yeah. was. And like, um, I was maybe more actually, it could be up to 70%. But <laughs> we, used to, we used to just go to the gym and hang out and we'd have a few beers the weekend. And we were very lost because, yeah. Like anybody in their 20s, of course, I, I'm still lost and I'm 38. So <laughs> you were kind of like, we were kind of finding our way at the time, you know, and uh, yeah. no, I suppose we were just, because we were filming all day, it was the case of like, we, we after a little while, we got into the truth, you know, it yeah. wasn't like a quick, quick kind of thing where like, you had to upload it quickly and okay, quick, you get it up this week because we're talking about this. It was more a very slow burner. So it kind of represented how we were living our lives and, maybe how society was at the time. It was more slower paced. Yeah. So I don't think, I don't think, I def definitely wasn't actively trying to do anything to show that my life was at a slow pace. I don't think anybody else was. 
But yeah, maybe yeah. in the edits there was a bit of that. But um, I just think that that was the way it was back in them times. Maybe yeah. people are going to look back in these times and say, Jesus, you know, we lived such a slow life back in 2023 when people only had one TikTok account and one laptop. <laughs> yeah, I just think you, whatever way it happened, I don't know what it was. You just, there's something that you captured about that kind of like, um, rural kind of existence and just the, and just the kind of funny things that like even the cars and everything like I just I remember being younger and people who had kind of like spoilers and stuff just being the fucking cool yeah yeah that was it you <laughs> see you had a spoiler and you were just everybody in the town respected you because you had a spoiler that had no effect on your car whatsoever but it was the simple things like that you know yeah there was one lad in town he had a CB aerial and like well, actually, sorry, there was a gang of lads with CB aerials. And like, you know, there's those CBs where you like, you can talk to lads in trucks. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They're like two-way radios. or Sometimes you can have a bit more conversations. But there was one lad and he had like a CB aerial that was so high that like you would be clipping off wires and everything like that. But everyone was like, look at that lad driving around town. And that was like, he was genuinely known as a very cool dude because he had... A CB aerial, a spoiler, and one of the first Ford Fiestas in town. Wow, I love, I love that. Was it? The, was there ever the tractor thing in uh, in in Mayo and Swinford where, like, if you had tractor and a bit of land, that was like you were you no were road getting... frontage. It wasn't really a thing. No, I, I do. I, I remember hearing over the years a lot about like, does he have much road frontage? Yeah, but yeah. Really, I don't remember hearing much of that when I was growing up. But um. Well, uh, tractors it was more so about honda civics that was the real thing for me yeah, yeah. everyone who was obsessed with it but what where did you go to school cavan or dublin oh no dublin i'm a i'm a i'm a self-confessed so i'm a i'm probably the worst in everyone's eyes in in ireland i'm probably the worst of the the worst i'm a proper side so i'm not fully side side at least i'm aware that i'm from the side side um of dublin but i it's a bird it's to live with there's now there's good places and bad places everywhere. Like so, it's just you no. Know, I think it's more I think the, it's more the culture. I I mean I particularly find um it to be a bit out of touch with reality. But um okay, I love I, I did. Enjoy, I'm not gonna lie. I, like I enjoyed. I definitely. I love I I love Dublin, and I just think that you know I, I'm sure it's the same in most cities. You have kind of like more affluent areas, and and it can become a bit like more about what you know the, again more focus on superficial elements of life rather than I always love going to Cavan I always love going to places where I felt like I didn't have to you know tell people what I was doing with my life you know that like, people didn't yeah. care kind of stuff yeah yeah unfortunately it's like a it's a side effect of places that become more affluent you kind of get yeah. more involved in co commercialism and like you know you have to have a nice phone then and you have to have a nice car or yeah. if people are like, all oh, right, you know, you kind of look a bit out of place if you're driving an old banger in an affluent area. But I suppose that's the price you pay for comforts in a way, too, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think maybe I, like I'm, I'm a musician as well. And I also like I like stories and I like writing things. And I think. Obviously, you can have stories come and not you can write great. There's been great stories written about Dublin as well. And Dublin has fantastic elements to it. I just think that I love those kind of like. The, the parts of humanity that we don't want to see that I think are often where the most amazing sort of things come from, you know, like I remember being in West Cork and seeing a guy driving a car that was like 90, in 1987 and it literally had holes in the back of it and it would just, <laughs> it would cut out and it was just rubbish. It was like, it was no <laughs> NCT ready, like nothing right with it. But I always remember it. it was just hilarious. It was just the funniest thing ever. And he, there's this big hill that he come down towards the pier, and he, he just wouldn't be sure whether it was gonna, it was gonna, yeah, yeah, gonna hold or whatever. And um, and he could, and the guy he was driving, he'd come out, and he'd have the most, he, he, you know, he'd have like the tobacco stains on his lead, on his, yeah. on his beard. And I think there's something so important about like that kind of like, I that's why I think Cardi Books is great about how it. You, you do sort of, there's no sort of like um, it glamour about it. It's just sort of like exactly what. Yeah, it it's a bit, it's quite raw, like, which I think is, is, is important because if it's too polished, you know, it's kind of like, well, yeah, maybe it can still be good. Don't get me wrong. But yeah. I think the good thing about Hardy Books is the fact that it is raw and it's showing a true representation of how Ireland was at that time. So it's almost like 
you can really truly see how Ireland was at that time if you watch the Hardy books. It's not just about like the lads. It's also about like showing you how the cars were and the people and yeah. how kind of people communicated. So that's, I think that's the elements where we're kind of going for the realness of it, you know? I think, and, uh, you, have, I think you have the best, I've, ne I've never, the best nicknames for characters I've ever come across in my life. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> well, they're all, yeah, yeah. So Buzz McDonald one that came from Eddie Durkin or Martin Maloney, sorry. He came up with that name. <laughs> Billy Buzz McDonald. And I was like, right, I'll take that one. And then French Toast, he was over in India and they were like, uh, he was coming back and they're like, come up with a nickname. So he goes, right, I like French Toast. I'll go with that. And then O'Toole at the end of it is a great name. And then we were doing a prank phone call one night, myself and Martin Maloney and another lad. And uh, the fellow was like, who's this? And I was like, Eddie Durkin. And then the name just took from there anyways. So, and then the boo, the boo is a funny one because uh, he... He used to be called, what was it? Oh, yeah, we were walking through town one time and someone was talking to somebody else, but his name is Tom. Yeah. But they were talking to somebody else and they go, Tommy Pooh. And everyone was like, oh, is your nickname Tommy Pooh? And he goes, no, I don't think he was talking to me. And he was talking, the person was talking to another fella. Oh. So then, because he didn't like the nickname, uh, Eddie Durkin came up with Bugenhagen, which I think is a character from one of the Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, which are movies <laughs> myself and Tom used to always watch together. Yeah, okay. So that, that name just stuck in Tommy Bugenhagen. And um, yeah, the nicknames are good. You know, the nicknames and the one-liners are good, but you need, you kind of need time for that stuff to sort of hatch. Yeah, yeah. What about the, what about the Viper? How did he, how did he come up with this, or how did that name? The Viper, I don't know. I don't know how he got so obsessed with snakes, but um, <laughs> all I remember is seeing the Viper on, on uh, set one day and he just had the, the Cobra t-shirt. And like at the time, you're like, that is funny. And even, but the more I, the more I think about it, the funnier it is because it's not even a viper on his top. So <laughs> it's, <laughs> he, it's a himself cover, and, yeah. cover, yeah, yeah. Himself and Martin actually were the two lads that came up with the, the Hardy Books idea. Okay, right, So yeah. like those two lads came up with the concept of Hardy Books and what we'd have is we'd have outlines for scenes. Like they might say like, okay, yourself and this other lad are arguing because you don't have enough money to get sandwiches. And then we just improvise it from there. So all the YouTube stuff, which I think was the best stuff, was all improvised. And then all the TV stuff, it was scripted. And then yeah. that was a bit, it was a bit more st staged. Yeah. So it lost a bit of its realness too. Yeah, but I think it's, it, 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 was, it was different, but I think it still had elements. Um, so I remember my, my, my brother is a bit older than me. So he was, I think I was, I was pretty young at the time. And I remember him see it shown it to me on youtube and then i remember i remember seeing it then on rt as well and i was probably a little bit older and couldn't kind of get it but i didn't i didn't really get it like i didn't really get the like the jokes and stuff i was too i think i was too young <laughs> now like re-watching it and i just think it's like it's just again it, it i you can relate to being in ireland you can relate to it so much like even i know you, you you guys wrote the characters about your you know you're saying say 70 percent <laughs> mm, well it depends it changes you know, that percentage changes <laughs> it's just very it's very relatable and the humor is just it's it's fantastic and do you do you, what what do you think about the what was the was the process more about was you trying to make each other laugh like was that yeah your, your goal that was that yeah that was the thing you see the process was more about i'm going to make my friends laugh so that when we're filming they're yeah. going to have to say no cut 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 no you ruined it man stop so that's what yeah. we were trying like that's what we we're all trying we we're almost like trying to sabotage each other but that in itself created this excitement where you were so close to laughing that you were kind of like you might be doing a certain face so it looked like you were acting really good or i don't know it, no, it probably <laughs> didn't look like we're acting good because that's no nobody's ever said the acting was good but um it was more so like we were trying to entertain each other and that was the world and it was not nothing to do with social media nothing to do with numbers nothing to do with putting it on the internet for people to see it was more so let's make each other laugh like a group of friends might try and make each other laugh on a night out yeah. or if you're if yourself and your mates are going somewhere for a weekend you know you're not really thinking you're not really thinking i'm going to make them laugh but when you're hanging out together you all start messing and then yeah. you know in jokes start building and everything like that so it was a very kind of like organic way that it started off and how do you keep, how do you keep the because sometimes it's hard when um you know like it's very easy to have that kind of organic thing happen off camera how did you keep the same kind of energy when you're on camera that it didn't become this. just a bit <laughs> <laughs> plenty of pints i know okay. um 
it was a case, well, the thing is, you see, we filmed like a lot, you know, like it's not like we filmed a scene and it was like, oh, perfect. That's that done. Let's move on to the next one. Yeah. We'd film, we'd film a scene that could go on for like three hours and the cameraman yeah. would be like, Jesus, I got to put down this camera as I'm sorry. You yeah. know, and like that could be three hours of filming. And normally, I, I don't really know exactly, but like normally they, they'll do a scene and it could take 20 minutes or half an hour or whatever, or even yeah. less, like, you know, but we were filming in a good bit and then they were cutting it down to the, the nice bits that made a story. So God bless, God bless the Viper for putting a story together because there was a lot of shit talk in between. So I suppose one of the ways we, one of the ways we got the natural talk on camera was that we filmed a lot and then we would have one or two beers and like, we'd kind of hit a sweet spot. Yeah. Um, not, we wouldn't always be drinking, but there'd be like times where like we might have a few beers. But there'd be plenty of times where we wouldn't have beers, but the excitement of having a camera there. Yeah. And it was a novelty for us back in them days to see a camera. You're like, oh, Jesus. Yeah. Kind of slightly exciting to have a camera there. Yeah. So you'd be kind of maybe slightly playing up to that a bit too. And yeah. like, I suppose we're all friends. And as well as that, we had a few years together hanging out in Galway in different places. So we kind of knew each other well. So it was kind of like five aside football team. Yeah. That kind of knew where the players were. Yeah, so were you all were you in college together or you grew up together or what was the myself myself and the boo we kind of know each other since we were maybe 12 and then because okay. I went to a small national school yeah and I didn't really know any of the lads but then we, when I went into the secondary school I started hanging out with the boo and then I started yeah. playing football with French toast and then French toast where we're living in Galway and then salmon I've known salmon since I was five okay yeah but and then I, I met the viper then in secondary school and I met cowboy in secondary school and I met Eugene Maloney or Big Mick is, is Eddie Durkin's uh, uncle so he was always knocking around town and he hung out with my uncle so I was like I know him he looks like he's good crack <laughs> but like I never thought I'd spend time with him but um so uh, what was that what was the question just about how you guys came like how did you get to know each other how was the oh so then yeah sorry so then we built up through like myself and the boo were hanging out in Galway and like we were up to crazy stuff too like we used to like go on mad nights out and we would go to we went to Grand Canaries like with the gang of lads and there was like silly stories circulating. And then one time French Toast turns up to the house with this long red haired dude who's like playing the guitar and it was like Eddie Durkin. And he's like, come on, let's go over there and we'll talk to these people. And myself and the boo, we were, we were kind of like more kind of like, not shy, but we're kind of more like kind of quiet lads and we'd get a bit tipsy and then we'd have the crack. Well, there's yeah. Eddie Durkin was like this bat out of hell. He was like meatloaf on steroids. And uh, we'd, we'd be like just going around to people chatting to them and we'd have a, a speaker with us. He'd be playing guitar. And then we just kind of like, it was the four of us would be hanging out together. And it was like, I don't know, it was like we kind of all had different personality traits that we liked about each other. Yeah, yeah. Plenty of arguments along the way as well, obviously. But uh, <laughs> it what? was more so like we just, yeah, we just like a chemistry, I suppose. What about, uh, is Tim, Tim Carr from Cavan, is he? Is he... Tim Card is from Gowna and Cavan, yeah, and he, yeah, yeah. I think he knew, I don't know who he knew first, but I think he came down, it could have been for the TV episodes, I'm not quite sure when Sim Card came into it first, but yeah. he came up with that name on the bus down from, <laughs> from, uh, from Cavan, so it's a long old bus journey back in them days, I think he has a car now, but know, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it just shows you like that opens doors because now he's on Dancing with the Stars. Yeah, 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 and he did, he did a good few Things on RTE as well, isn't he? And yeah, uh, it's, he's the sexiest of all of us, you see. So he's got the Hollywood look. <laughs> um, <laughs> and like, how how did the did the scenes that you made, like the kind of um, the sort of like setups you had? Like, I, I I watched a couple of them last night, just kind of like get myself to sort of like put myself back, re refresh myself with it. And I was watching one of, I think it was maybe season three i think and it was the one about the swingers you know and and you're you're all in the you're all in the 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 uh, eddie has his girlfriend kira and you're all in the like swinging thing and then there's oh, the, yeah. sing, the singles thing and then you're, you're all in the room waiting for him to come yeah, in yeah 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 <laughs> well i mean like if you're if you're in a like a, a crappy hot tub <laughs> with like your friends with your tops off and someone's recording you're kind of like what the hell is going on here so you're kind of you're kind of giddy anyways yeah but how did you come up with that? How are you like? What was it? Was there any like? Did you sit when it got kind of further along when you're with OT and then did, did you have to sit down and write the stuff or did you keep the same process going throughout the whole thing? 
No, the, pro the well, the process kind of changed a bit. Like, so starting off, it was Eddie Durkin and the Viper said to myself and Salmon, do you want to yeah. film a little project we're doing? Like, so it, we're going to be in Swinford filming. And yeah. we were kind of like, yeah, what do you want us to do? Like, do you want us to be a, a, like a nice person or whatever? They're like, just whatever. So I was thinking, okay, I, I always like ignorant people. I, I like looking at them or listening to them yeah. talking shit. And Salmon mm -hmm. is naturally funny. So we just kind of started recording from there. And we look back and on the footage and uh, we were like, oh, there's some, some kind of funny bits there. And then the Viper edited it all, edit, edited it all together, okay. making it into a story. And I was like, geez, that looks good. And then slowly but surely started bringing in French Toast and the Boo and uh, Cowboy and Big Mick and Lexus and everybody. And it kind of sort of, it kind of grew from there, I suppose. But Eddie Durkin and the Viper, they, they would always come up with the, um, the scene idea, you know, like okay. if, if it was the Mitzi Turbo Cup, was I think it could have been Eddie Durkin's idea but it could have been the Vipers too so those kind of ideas but then we'd be like what if we're standing over there and we've got like uh, there's a car spinning around or what if there's two lads fighting in a trailer yeah. so all, everybody was throwing in ideas all the time and they were filtering the ideas to pick the best ones yeah that's the yeah and did, do you um, was there I mean for you personally or for anyone else was there any kind of influence that you were you know, what, what, what were the things that you would have grown up watching or comedy wise? What was, was there any comedians that you'd have been influenced by or series or anything? Um, for the lads, I think the lads were big into the likes of Chris Morris okay. and um, Trailer Park Boys and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I did, I watched a bit of Trailer Park Boys myself as well. And um, comedy wise, I can't really think, you know, I can't really think of it. I was thinking about that before actually, but from, personally for myself, I was just like, maybe my uncles are kind of funny and my, my mother's mm. funny, but uh, for the lads, definitely, I think it was Trailer Park Boys and Chris, Chris Morris, but for the likes of myself and Salmon and the Boo, we never really actively watched comedians or anything like that, you know? Yeah. Um, Would you have watched Father Ted yeah. at all when you were in our... Oh in yeah, our definitely, definitely watch Father Ted, yeah, but like, if I, I can't personally say if, if it influenced my character. Oh, yes. well, I'm just I never... Yeah, I never thought about, like, I was never thinking about that when I was filming. I was never like, okay, I'll do it like this lad. But Father Ted, we, yeah, it was very big in my house anyways. Yeah. And so was Mr. Bean. Well, you know who was big, actually, now that I think about it? You know Tommy Cooper? Yeah, 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 yeah. Some people don't like him, but, like, I, I thought he was kind of funny because he was just, uh, like, he was just a kind of maniac, you know? And uh, yeah, yeah. just the way he'd be, like, doing tricks and the tricks would be going badly. And it was kind of like the awkwardness of it all. It was, it's kind of like yeah. something funny about that, you know? And, the, was yeah, there is, there is there were, I mean, not that I might be reading into it too much, but that, that he's not, he's not very polished at all either. Like if you think he's, no. he's, he's, he is, he is polished obviously in the way that he practices it and he knows what he's doing, but it's, it's much more kind of, um, it's not like, it's not a facade. It's not a show kind of a thing. He's just, it's very sort of like whimsical, very kind of. Um, yeah. It's more like a spectacle as well. It's not almost yeah. like the show itself. It's not just the show itself, but it's the memory of a, a, like this massive dude with a little, I don't know what those hats are called, but yeah, yeah. Um, just doing, doing tricks that don't really work out. It was like, it's so, I don't know, that's the way I saw it anyway. Do, do you think that, our, this is going to, this could be, a, again, I could be psychoanalyzing too much here, but do you think that our Irish people in general have that humor is a cope, like we have, a, it's a very good coping mechanism for a kind of like. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It's a deflection mechanism and a coping mechanism yeah. and. I suppose like life, life is a long journey and a lot of curveballs along the way. So yeah. if, if you can use comedy as one of your weapons or make, make people laugh, everybody does it, you know, even in small yeah. talk or everybody in the street is joking around. So, well, not, not necessarily joking around, but everyone's got a funny quip. So I think a lot of people, especially normally, I, I could be wrong, like, but I always find that good looking people because they get through life with their looks they don't necessarily need to rely on their humor as much. Yeah. But then again, I suppose that would mean that no good looking people are funny, but look at me. I'm gonna get <laughs> <laughs> no, but like there's a lot of good looking people. Like Tommy Tiernan's a good looking lad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know where not, I'm going with that, but. No, I know what you mean. There's there is, I think, yeah, if you don't have to, if you don't have to kind of find your way of, I mean, I think a lot of it's got to do with, you know getting i don't want to put it simply but getting the ride kind of like if you can <laughs> if you don't if you're not like attractive or you're not maybe you don't you don't think you're physically like what's your next avenue in you know like and yeah humor is a good way of you know making things happen or 
Or, yeah, uh, definitely, because you know it can it can get you on dates and it can get you into the right jobs and it can get you a few free pints and and yeah. everything like that. Like, so there's nothing wrong with it. Like, you know, it's good. To, it's good to, I suppose, try to be witty or whatever like that. You know, so. But I think Irish people are very funny, like naturally. But, um, you know, life, as I said, life itself, it's it's good because like life is crazy. So it's why not why not look at it from a slightly whimsical perspective if you can. Yeah. You think Ireland is a um. I certainly think it's probably one of the most focused countries on just being funny. I don't, I, I, I mean, it's obviously their country, but when you're, when you're in Ireland, you just, the kind of make laughing and stuff like that seems to be the focus of a lot of. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And I think again, it's kind of like a deflection of how you maybe feel like, I know I use comedy like all the time, or I used to, when I'm getting older, I, I'd be more honest with how I'm feeling, but yeah, I certainly throughout my life, it was always comedy. I was like, I'll use comedy now to get through this difficult yeah. situation or like, you know, you kind of deflect, you deflect something. If someone's asking you a deep question and you didn't want answers, you're going to like make a little quip or a comedy thing just to, to sort of not tell them how you truly feel, I suppose, you know? Yeah. And, and when through, throughout the kind of stages of, I know you guys then had the, the film and you had another one. And then did do you, do you think you managed to keep the same kind of, did you still enjoy it as much as the more successful it got? Do you think, or was it harder to kind of keep the same level of, was it fun? People always say this about like, you know, it was so much fun in the beginning. And then sometimes when money and things get involved, or did you, did you keep the same kind of level? It's like, it's like going back to the football chat at the beginning. I think I definitely enjoy the whole thing, you know, and I'm so happy yeah. that I have, I have it. So that anytime, even if I'm in, you know, if I'm a 70 year old man and I'm with my grandchildren who are semi robots, I can show them. <laughs> I can show them uh, some footage of what I was up to back in the day. Yeah. But definitely, the beginning was more like, oh, "What's going on here now, Jesus?" Because this could be like a job for us, could it be? Or like, you know, we were kind of like back in them days. RT was the big thing, and they were showing interest, and everyone was like, "Oh, Jesus, you're doing well, lads. Fair play to you." You know, and mm. finally, people were respecting us. Yeah. So it was, um, it was kind of like slowly growing, and we we're hanging out with our friends. Not to say it wasn't stressful, like, but. I think definitely the beginning days were the best days. And then as it got more like kind of onto television or whatever, it was a lot to do with how many numbers, what's the ratings for this season or like, you know, you know, so it's almost like, like everything, it sort of loses its sparkle. Yeah. Like a small bit, you know? So that's why I think some people say to me, would you bring back another season or um, not that it's up to me, but like, would you have another season? And it, it, you'd have to be careful about how you do it too, you know? You have to maybe change the location and maybe set it in space or something like that. <laughs> was there was there pressure then involved? Did you feel at all pressurized at any stage as it got more kind of about the ratings or numbers? Did that mentally get to you or was it a small bit? Yeah, yeah, because you'd be thinking, like, was that funny? Or you'd be looking. I remember the first we watched the first episode of the TV stuff in a pub. And I remember like there was one lad sitting there with his arm folded and he was like, oh, this is shite. And he kind of oh. looked the other way and he was, we were yeah. like going, no, yeah. our dream has been crushed. So yeah. it's like bittersweet as well. You know, it, it sounds great on paper. Yeah. And it was, but like, there's also the other side of things too, where like there's an expectation. So yeah. like that expectation can definitely uh, put pressure on you, but mostly it's, it's pressure from yourself that you can, yeah. when you realize it and you look back, you're like, actually, that was just me putting pressure on myself when I could have enjoyed the journey more. Namaste. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how did you do i find that to be the toughest thing about how you deal with i'm often with things i release or, or do or you know i make music and things like that and i put it out i'm affected way more by one person sort of negative like not even maybe not even a negative comment maybe just saying something one little thing critical i can get as much praise as i want but that that one little thing in negativity affects me way more and i don't know how you, you dealt with that like how do you deal with the kind of you know, over the years, like, you know, like you might go to a gig and someone might say to you, geez, I thought you were taller. And you'd be like, right, have I been living a lie? Am I not <laughs> a normal height? Am I not a normal height for a man, no? Like, not that height matters, but like, you'd be like, 5'9", am I 5'10", I'm 5'10", 5'9", what am I? You know, or maybe I'm 5'8", you know, but yeah. it's just like, it plays on you a small bit. And like, we, like at the time, because we were in our early 20s, we're still figuring out ourselves and still are figuring out ourselves. Yeah. yeah, it could definitely make you insecure, but it's almost like um, it's almost like a, a university of education on how you feel about yourself, you know, especially 
I'm sure it's the same for you, for the new generation with phones. You're, you're looking at yourself. So you're kind of getting a different angle of yourself all the time. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you have to learn how to deal with yourself very quickly and accept yourself. So yeah. that's an important side of things. And like, good luck to anyone who can do that, like, because it's a good skill to have to be yeah. able to accept yourself. And it's very important to do that, too. Was it, was it so, weird at all seeing yourself on TV? Like I couldn't. She- didn't, didn't look at half, like, I, I haven't looked at half the episodes. Yeah, yeah. I haven't looked at half the stuff, which isn't a good thing either, because, you know, it's, it's good to be able to analyze yourself and say, oh, maybe I'm standing too much in a certain way, or maybe yeah. I'm talking too quickly. Yeah. So some of the lads would be like, as soon as the take is finished, they'd be like, can I see that back on the camera? Yeah. And they'd be watching it, and I'd be like, no, I don't want to see that. I can't be looking at myself. That just, I, yeah. I'd cringe. Yeah. But they were like, no, no, sure, it might help you. So I've kind of, well, because I edit my own stuff now, I have to look at myself and it's, you know, you have to accept yourself, you know, you can kind of lie to yourself, but sometimes the camera don't lie. What's there's a weird thing that happens sometimes with, um, I don't know what the name for it is, but with recording of your own voice, it's because I, I don't know what the <clears throat> science is behind it, but there's a kind of, when you record your voice and you hear <laughs> Yeah. Really you. does that happen with like watching yourself as well do you think do you think it's oh like- yeah i think that happens with everybody but definitely everybody. yeah for myself i'm like jesus have i been talking like that for years yeah yeah just just after getting over the height thing never mind the talking thing so but i think it, it it's also a superpower once you accept yourself it's kind of like a yeah. superpower yeah. because you know once you're happy within yourself sure nobody can touch you then like so i suppose i don't know how do you feel for the music do you how do you mind listening to your own voice uh, I got better. I've gotten a lot better at it. I think in the in the beginning, it used to. I used to, I could not. It just. I don't know. Again, like I had the same thing. I was like, "Do I actually sound that much like I'm from Dublin?" That really, that was one of the things I always used to get. So I would be like terrified that I'd have a real strong South Dublin accent. I was like, "Oh no!" Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, this is you know. I didn't want to sound. You know, I would hear my voice just sound so weird. But I think. I just did it so many times. I literally did it to the point of where, like, I hear my voice now on a daily basis that it's just, you sort of, it's like, a, it's like a, you get some sort of like immunity to it or something. You don't, you know. Yeah, or maybe an acceptance. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, you don't, you don't think about it that much or it's just part of the process. But um, it can, it can be, it can be challenging. I don't, I, like, I'll, I haven't reached any sort of level of the success, you know, the Hardy books have got to. And I just wonder what it's, what it's, because I always people always say you know like oh I got this got the success and everything and it was like it was difficult it, it wasn't you know it was great but it wasn't what I was after I don't know I don't know what your experience of was it how did you deal with the kind of like success of it and then the kind of ending of it and was that a tough process or um yeah it's, it, it can be like an insecure process because the, the fame side of things like I don't get me wrong I like being known in Ireland is a great thing because there's like people are so sound. Like the amount of people who are like, How are you getting on, Jesus? What are you up to now? I could be pulling into a garage in Longford, like chatting to a, to a lad who I've never met before, yeah. having a f- conversation like we're friends. I could go into like a restaurant or a cafe and I might see somebody in there and like they might be like, Oh, Jesus, yeah, my son was watching Hardy Books, fair pay tea. Yeah. So like you'd be having conversations with the most random people along the way. And that's brilliant, you know? Yeah. That's great. Like, but then I suppose when, it, when Hardy Books, how did how did we deal with the sorry what was the question how do we deal with the I kind of like the the peak of it and then the ending of it you know okay sorry my my, my phone is going to die now soon the okay. peaking of it was like it was strange because you're like i, I don't know what to do should, should i be more like outgoing or am, am i an extrovert am i an introvert yeah. so like for myself anyways i used to drink when i was out yeah and i still do actually so yeah. that's probably something i still need to work on to kind of yeah. balance the books with that like but um <laughs> I'm definitely much better than I used to be anyways with that. Um, but the expectation, yeah, again, it's like, at the end of the day, like everybody is trying to do their best in their own careers and everyone's life is as important as the next person's life. So you have to kind of get over yourself a bit too and say, well, yeah, it's only, it's only social media. It's only videos and like this content online. Everyone's making content. So it's not a big deal in the grand scheme of things, you know? Yeah. So you kind of have to accept it and see the absurdity of the whole thing and, not take it too seriously, but also don't become a dickhead and don't become a narcissist because, you know, numbers don't really mean anything at the end of the day. Yeah. Like, you know, when you're spending time with, you know, an old person and you can see that their health might be declining, 
who gives a shit then about like social media shares and, and likes and all that crap. Yeah. So it's a funny, funky world, but like, it's also good to realize that it doesn't really mean anything. I'd rather have a conversation one-on-one with somebody yeah. in a quiet corner of a pub or go for a walk with somebody, you know, and have the crack with them. That's, that's what I would prefer to do. But I do realize that the nature of the beast of what I'm involved in involves yeah, me, yeah. you know, also like having to perform slightly in order to be an entertainer. That's a seriously good at it. Like to have come to that realization is seriously good because you could easily end up feeling, you know, just constantly live, want, like thinking about the past. You're constantly thinking about getting back to some sort of time or whatever, but it's good to. Yeah. It, it, don't get me wrong. Like it's, I still use social media and sometimes I'm like looking at it going, Oh, I need to upload something now quickly because I haven't done this. Or what if people forget about me or the, probably moved on to something else of course they have there's a lot of cooler stuff out there you know or yeah, i'm yeah. getting old now i'm nearly 40 what am i doing like how can i look my father in the face and say i'm a social media influencer dad you, you know <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to be a farmer i want to be a youtuber <laughs> so like but again you have to accept that life life is crazy you know and um, i know in ireland anyways in a lot of ways we're living in a fairly good time obviously again going back to the, the rental situation it's, it's very difficult for people i'm not saying it isn't but yeah. like in other ways, Ireland is doing pretty good. So like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be here complaining about it either. Like, cause yeah. I am very happy and privileged as to what I've been given and got. Yeah. yeah. And I thank God. Thank you, man. <laughs> okay. Brilliant.